So when I arrived in Kenya, um, in I want to say May 27th, 2017, um, is when we got there exactly. These are people who I've never met before and so I'm literally trusting with them with my life. And I um, had accepted the fact that anything could go wrong. I was hoping that this wouldn't um, backfire, like the whole plan wouldn't backfire. Um, but I was definitely scared, I was petrified. Um, and I knew, um, you know, once I was gathering my belongings and sneaking into my mother's room to grab my passport, that this would be a move that would completely destroy my relationship with my family. After this, there's absolutely no way I can have the same relationship with my mother ever again. Um, my name is Mahar Awad. I am a politics major at Ithaca College. Um, I'm a junior and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am the first um, in my uh, media family to go to a four-year institution. I had to lobby, I had to speak to um, relatives, I had to um, even get my uh, guidance counselor involved to try to convince my mother in particular that this would be a great option for me. It's very rare for you know um, a young immigrant um, from a, a Somali background to get a full ride to uh, a nice liberal arts college in the Northeast and so I kind of sold that to her and eventually she bought into it. Um, she would have preferred that I stayed around but she knew that leaving for school um, would be beneficial for me in the long run. I remember um, uh, April um, of my freshman year my mother was talking about uh, potentially going to Kenya um, um, to spend some time there with my family. Um, so I was born in Kenya. I visited there um, when I was uh, seventh grade, eighth grade, uh, mostly to just be exposed to life there as well. Um, and my mother proposed that I you know, go back there again and see some family members and reunite with them and um, basically have the opportunity to just chill after my first year of college. Um, and I was pretty fond of that idea. There was a week in between leaving for Africa and um, like after class ended. And so I spent a week in Minnesota and um, my family um, was getting ready to go to Kenya. I was excited, um, you know, I had plans to basically tour all of East Africa and I was like planning out everything, like what countries I would go to, who I would see, what destinations I would visit. Um, and um, when I arrived in Kenya, so like we got on the airplane we got there. My mother was being a little elusive. Um, I, because um, the plan was initially to spend three months in Kenya and then for me to return um, to Ithaca College um, come fall semester. And so that's what was going through my mind the entire time. Um, little did I know that my parents had other um, plans for me. We stayed at a local hotel um, the very first night my mother said that I would have my own hotel room and I would be separated from everyone else. And that was deeply suspicious, but I was incredibly tired and I didn't think too much of it. So I stayed in the hotel room that night and then woke up the next morning. And then my mother basically came and sat down and she had a very serious expression on her face. And I knew right then and there that um, things weren't going to look too good. Um, and I also remember her holding two pieces of paper in her hand and I asked her what those pieces of paper were about and then she basically handed them to me. Um, and I took a look at it and I was like, wow, I didn't see this coming at all. Um, the two articles that um, I had written for my campus publication, The Ithican, one talked about why I left Islam and the other one talked about, um, it, it was on a topical issue concerning the campus but in there I had included the fact that I was gay. My mother basically was like this is you know incredibly unacceptable and this is more or less her last ditch attempt at trying to reform me and she basically informed me that I would need to number one withdraw from Ithaca College and number two I would be uh, placed under the care in her own words of um, religious authorities so a group of religious clerics. 
um, whose main goal would be, again, to reorient my sexuality and basically um, um, convert me back to Islam. And I knew that this was basically our, our life and death situation and that I had to immediately get out. Um, so in order to get out of there, I called my friend Muhammad Sayed, who is based in Washington, D.C., um, and he is the president of an organization called Ex-Muslims of North America. Once Muhammad found out about this, he uh, immediately contacted the U.S. Embassy um, in Kenya. Um, however, there was one trick. Um, American employees at the U.S. Embassy are strictly forbidden from entering the neighborhood that I was staying in due to high crime and terror attacks. And so I had to basically devise a plan to get out of there. Um, so later that night, I, um, when everyone was sleeping, I snuck into my mom's hotel room. I grabbed my passport, um, took whatever belongings I could get, and fled downstairs. Got into the cab, which later took me to the embassy. When I reached the U.S. Embassy, I spoke to the general consul, who um, he interviewed me, um, and I told him what happened. And, um, and he remarked that um, within the month of May alone, there were 27 other cases of um, American, young American uh, Somalis reaching out to the U.S. Embassy from different parts of Africa, um, crying for help, basically. And their parents also um, tricked them into coming to a Africa under the pretense of a summer vacation. And, you know, and they found out later that they wouldn't be going back to the United States. I received an email um, that was sent to me and several other colleagues across campus um, from someone else who worked here who said, I, am, I have become aware of the situation of a student that we have. I'm very worried about their safety. Um, I, I just want to pull a bunch of people together and get our best thinking about, is there, is there anything that we can do for him um, while he is out of the country? Um, and if it's possible for him to return, uh, is there a way that we can offer him safety and sanctuary on the Ithaca College campus and what would that take? So that's the first way I found out about it. And immediately um, there was a, a very quick and very supportive and very resourced response. There was a big gap in between the Kendi events and when I decided to finally speak out, which was in February 2018. I thought long and hard about it and I thought the Ithacan would be the best publication to publish this because um, it's basically where it kind of all started. Uh, you know, there were two articles that I had written there that got me into a lot of trouble. And so it made a lot more sense to publish it in the Ithaca, not only for that reason, but for the fact that this is, you know, the campus paper. This is where the community finds out about what happens on this campus. And so um, I, went, I shared that with them. Um, and it was very well received, thankfully. There are a couple major ways that I think about this, and one that I always try to make sure that everyone knows about, and that I didn't bring up as Mahad's story was unfolding during that summer, um, but that I was holding dear in my heart is, Mahad is not the first person that is a member of our campus community who has experienced a family who has tried to force them into conversion therapy. Um, he is the, the one that has chosen to be the most public, and his story um, by its very nature, brings up many different intersectional issues having to do with family, having to do with faith, um, having to do with um, not his but his family's um, um, nationalities, right, and, and family members around the world. Um, he is absolutely not the first student I have known or have tried to assist in this situation. I'm like, I would like to think that I'm grieving, well, I'm done grieving my family. Um, I would like to think that I'm over it. I would like to think that I can move past beyond this, um, but I don't think that has been the case. Um, like, I resent them for what they did to me, but at the same time, I still love them deeply and I want them back in my life. And um, that is going to be a tension that I'm going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. I think about them every day, I would say. Um, and uh, especially my mother, you know, I, I can't let this you know, drown me. I can't let this just make me be secluded. Um, and, um, but still, like, the emotional trauma will be there. And it's something I need to, you know, productively deal with. This piece is titled Transforming Trauma into Advocacy. When parents do unspeakable things to their children, is it worth publicly naming and shaming their bad behavior? 
is sharing your emotional and painful narrative worth the psychological damage? In other words, is there any value in relieving these issues, something that it inevitably comes with speaking out? As unbearable as it is to acknowledge this, it's not unfathomable to think that she still loves me beneath everything else. After all, it was her misguided sense of religious correction to keep me from going out that in large part motivated her to do all this. I suspect that my mother is at a place right now where she's feeling tested by this, and she's reinforcing whatever negative belief she has. I hope that's not the case. I have yet to hear from her. Either way, being a victim in one circumstance does not justify your crimes. If my mother is seriously suffering because I went against her religious and cultural beliefs, that's unheard to figure out.